Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Field, and I'm going to talk to you about conduct problems, disruptive behavior, and cluster B personality disorders. Oh my, quite a bit in one video lecture. We're going to look at the disorders uh, that occur during childhood related to conduct, oppositional defiance, conduct disorder, intermittent explosive disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation, which you may remember was a holdover from the depression chapter, the depression category, pyromania and kleptomania, and in adulthood, the cluster B personality disorders, antisocial personality, borderline personality, histrionic personality, and narcissistic personality. Conduct problems and disruptive behavior often begin in childhood. For example, conduct disorder is a precursor to antisocial personality in adulthood. Early treatment can have a dramatic impact and can turn a child around before the consequences become persisting, for example, when an adult develops a legal record. It also can um, uh, make sure that uh, patterns are addressed before they become more ingrained. And what you see happen during adulthood is that personality disorders become you know, quite persisting, ongoing, chronic, rigid. Uh, not really pliable to change, at least at the personality structure level. You can certainly help a person cope with symptoms, but their personality tends to be pretty, pretty stable in adulthood, whereas there is more room for change and growth in childhood and adolescence in my clinical experience. Let's look at oppositional defiance first. This is marked by an angry or irritable mood, whereby the person can also be resentful. This uh, irritability, this anger, is often dysregulated, meaning the person doesn't feel in control of uh, their emotions. It's also mixed with argumentative or defiant behavior. The person argues with authority figures and adults. They defy authority and refuse to comply with rules at school and the community. They deliberately annoy others and engage in power struggles, initiate power struggles, and they externalize blame and avoid responsibility. They also can demonstrate vindictiveness, which is spiteful and vindictive behavior. So that's intentional uh, attempts to kind of hurt others, if you will, uh, verbally, at least twice in the last six months. Okay. Note that the vindictiveness tends to be, again, more verbal, or if it's behavioral, very mild, something like, you know, taking someone's, like destroying something that belongs to someone, rather than uh, actually threatening harm or, or inflicting harm to another person, typically, uh, through physical means. In terms of severity, what's interesting here is that setting plays a large role. So a mild severity would be just in one setting, for example, at school. Moderate would be in two settings, school and home, for example. And severe would be three settings, school, home, and community. Let's see a video example of how a person might present in a counseling session with an oppositional or defiant uh, type of behavior. So how do you feel about being here today? Oh, I don't really need to be here. Well, um, maybe what would be helpful to talk about today? Whatever you want. Doesn't really matter to me. What's interesting about this video is the client looks seems to look towards the counselor who's talking to them. They're not looking down or looking away, which might suggest that the person is just more anxious when they say things like, I'm not sure why I'm here or, you know, I don't need to be here. Instead, the person is almost like throwing down the gauntlet of, I don't need to be here and you're going to tell me that I need to be here, right? In other words, they're trying to initiate a power struggle. And of course, the counselor's role here is to try to avoid that. Right? and try to kind of um, step bes beside that rather than engage in the power struggle because you know it won't end well. Okay, let's talk about conduct disorder next. This is considered a more serious and significant disorder that occurs during childhood. It's um, marked by violation of the basic rights of others and of rules in the schools and communities. The violation of basic rights of others um, is particularly pronounced and includes aggression to people and animals, destruction of property, deceitfulness or theft, and serious rule violations. So let's look at the first uh, couple. 
Serious rule violations are you know, really just more about rules, but aggression, destruction of property, and deceitfulness and theft tends to have a more interpersonal flavor to it. So aggression, you're looking for bullying, threatening, fighting, intimidating, and using a weapon uh, during those uh, acts, physical cruelty to people or to animals, and forcing someone into sexual activity. Pretty significant aggression there. Destruction of property, for example, you're looking at deliberate fire setting with the intent to cause damage. Deceitfulness or theft, stealing, breaking into someone's house, building, or car. Lying or conning to obtain goods, avoiding obligations. And then serious rule violations include things like running away from home overnight uh, at least twice or for a long, lengthy period. And then being often truant from school before the age of 13. In terms of the uh, coding structure, we would code this differently based on whether or not the onset occurred during childhood or adolescence. There's also an important specifier. With limited prosocial emotions is a particularly significant warning sign that this may be a more significant form of conduct disorder that if untreated may transfer into something like antisocial personality. If a person, let's say, violates the rules of others and they hurt others, we would expect the person to have some degree of remorse or guilt about it, right? And to feel a sense of responsibility for other people and to con be concerned about them, have some degree of empathy. You will also meet some ch children and adolescents who lack that. They don't have a sense of remorse or guilt for their actions. They're unconcerned about how others respond and also about their performance overall, say at school. And they come across as having a fairly shallow emotional life and interpersonal life, right? They don't have deep friendships. There are environmental influences to both oppositional defiant disorder and a conduct disorder that are worth spending some time on. From a biopsychosocial model, the psychological and the social factors are much more pronounced than the biological factors. Not that conduct disorder doesn't have some degree of genetic influence in how, it, how a person might develop it, uh, but by and large, it is the psychological and the social factors, and particularly the social factors, that have a large influence here. Let's take a look at oppositional defiant through the lens of the biopsychosocial model. The person engages in power struggles with caregivers, and that is often caused by their household being rife with high-intensity conflict and where verbal and physical aggression often occurs. So, in other words, the person has learned that to survive, I need to have a fairly contrarian interpersonal style, a fairly aggressive interpersonal style. And so, in a way, this is adaptive, right? That the person has learned, basically, how to best survive in their environment. Okay, so in other words, the social factors are quite strong here. With conduct disorder, uh, we also think about that a person has to exist in often quite dangerous uh, environments, situations, neighborhoods, and so they may develop a stance of self-preservation even at the expense of other people um, in order to survive there. And so you can hear sometimes cognitions from a, a person with conduct disorder that, that go something like, they may have done the same thing if they had the chance. You can only rely on yourself. And what I'll tell you is that um, having worked with a number of clients with conduct disorder over the years, clients who exist in violent, dangerous environments tend to have the most severe versions of conduct disorder, right, in response to their environment. What I think is a little different, though, and, and tells you that there's um, more, you know, even more of a problem, is if a person doesn't develop any sense of empathy or concern for others, or in, enjoys inflicting pain to others. Typically, you don't anticipate that if you grow up in a fairly you know dangerous neighborhood or what have you you're still going to care for the people around you and you're still going to have a sense of empathy for others typically so if you're not developing that that usually is a, a sign that there's something uh, even more wrong there and the person's even more at risk i'll note here that treatment can be difficult because the environment around the person is unlikely to change for example, changing conflict within a family is very difficult. You can do it with family therapy and in-home therapy, but it takes a long time to dial that down, particularly if the caregivers are just, they just are that way. You know, they just tend towards more passionate forms of altercation, of, of conflict. 
In addition, uh, if you look at conduct disorder, you would have to change the environment quite significantly for a person, to, you know, to uh, have the best chance at, at being able to, you know, move away from some of those behaviors. So, for example, if a person is growing up in a dangerous environment where there's gang activity, ideally, you're able to get them out of the gang if they're involved already or prevent them from joining a gang through things like after school programming, things like that. And maybe even more structural changes, such as if the person exists in an environment that is fairly impoverished, right? Can you get resources to those neighborhoods and communities when it's needed? Can you advocate with civic city leaders in that regard? Again, that's not easy to do, right? And that tends to be longer term work. Um, so just kind of know that, that, that the social factors here are quite difficult to interrupt but are crucial to the development of these problems. John Gottman, the expert in couples, one of the experts in couples counseling, developed this, I think, quite nice metaphor for differentiating oppositional defiance from conduct disorder. It's an imperfect metaphor, though, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So he said that typically a person with oppositional defiance, their bark is worse than their bite. They tend to be quite verbally aggressive, but they are only typically physically aggressive if they're just very, very dysregulated. Okay, but typically most of it is verbal aggression. Whereas conduct disorder tends to be marked by, uh, if there is violence, that's just more thought out, devious, conniving kind of. And so the person, for example, may wait for the opportune moment to uh, rob someone, right? Or to physically assault them or etc sexually assault them and so um, Gottman would say that you know the person isn't dysregulated per se when engaging in those types of violent acts and so it just looks you know more like this kind of sudden uh, aggression that comes out of nowhere like you'd expect a viper to demonstrate I think the me metaphor is a bit imperfect though because having worked with a number of children adolescents with conduct disorder and adults with antisocial personality what I'll tell you is some of the aggression can be quite impulsive as well and dysregulated. For example, a lot of adults with antisocial personality that I've worked with get into things like bar fights. You know, those aren't premeditated typically. Okay. To give you an example of what a premeditated uh, form of like deviousness and conniving looks like in conduct disorder, I once worked with an adolescent who was, I believe, about 16 at the time in, on an inpatient unit. Who had conduct disorder and after a group therapy session they had uh, asked to meet with me and they proceeded to tell a fairly long-winded story lasted at least an hour about things like the neighborhood they grew up in the trauma they experienced as a child and I believe a caregiver who either died or left suddenly and at the very end of this story the, the person told me so you know and I, now I really want you to tell my doctor that I've told you these things, to let my doctor know that I've told you these things. And I remember thinking, that's an interesting statement. And so I asked, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what do you want the doctors to know about this? Why is that important? And they said something along the lines of, well, you know, I'm really trying to open up here and uh, making good progress. And I think I'm, you know, I want the doctor to know that I'm going to be ready for discharge soon. So in other words, I left that meeting with a sense that a, I wasn't sure if most of what they told me was actually truthful, to be honest, though I, and I don't know either way. You know, you can't prove it, really. Uh, but uh, what I did know for sure was that their intent of telling me that story was to influence their discharge decision. And so that is a form of manipulation, right, to, to kind of uh, trick you in a way into believing a certain something so that then you can communicate something to the doctor about that. And so, you know, when a person does this, when the people around them realize that they are being conned, people are going to move away from them and reject them. And that often occurs during conduct disorder and antisocial personality that the people around them can feel disturbed by their behavior and move away from them. Okay, let's talk about intermittent explosive disorder next. This is, a, I would say, a form of impulse control problem. It doesn't have the same flavor as ODD and, and conduct disorder. In that with ODD, you often look at uh, parental conflict, right? And power struggles with caregivers and authority figures. With conduct disorder, you're looking for this, you know, kind of deceitfulness and, and um, an intentional 
uh, hurt of others. Uh, you know that that feels a bit more either planned for or or, or you know feels a uh, you know a bit more you know problematic really that that you're willing to violate the rights of others. In intermittent explosive disorder, you can have quite significant aggression episodes, but they are not premeditated and they're not born out of power struggle. So you're looking for recurrent aggressive outbursts that are defined as either fairly uh, uh, frequent, at least twice a week, at least verbal or physical aggression for three months, but that does not destroy property or injure animals or people. Or more significant episodes, at least three in the last 12 months, of verbal or physical aggression that involves destroying property or injuring animals or people. Again, the intent here is is not, you know, to harm others for your own gain or this not this kind of, um, you know, lack of remorse and, and, and deceitfulness to it, but they're just dysregulated. So aggression is not premeditated and it's out of context with provocation. Disruptive mood dysregulation was in the depression chapter and you may wonder why. So let me talk about the history of it fairly briefly. Before the DSM-5 was developed, psychiatrists were concerned that children, particularly younger children, were being overdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. The presentations that they would see that, that were given that diagnosis that did not that were not uh, manifestations of mania more formally included things like prolonged rage episodes where a child would become quite agitated, dysregulated, dis and, and engage in destructive behavior, aggressive behavior, and could last for hours. And so the thought was, well, isn't that a form of mania? And they may have had a bipolar disorder diagnosis. And over time, what, what they found actually was when they tracked these children, most of them were not diagnosed with bipolar disorder later on in life. Instead, they were diagnosed with depression. And so the general thought was, well, we need another disorder that captures these temper episodes, if you will, that isn't depression, because of course that isn't really a part of depression as a diagnosis but it's not bipolar disorder either. And so initially they had developed a diagnosis called temper dysregulation disorder, which then morphed into disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which did make it into DSM-5. So this is quite similar to intermittent explosive disorder, except that you tend to uh, be on the lookout for mood symptoms here. What I'll note is that depression tends to look very different in children and can lead to significant irritability, which helps us understand why you might see these prolonged rage episodes. So just similar to intermittent explosive disorder, you're looking for severe recurrent temper outbursts three or more times a week. That's more frequent than intermittent explosive disorder. Symptoms present for at least 12 months. That duration is longer, I believe, than intermittent explosive disorder, if I remember right. The child is aged 6 to 18 years, and onset has to occur before the age of 10. It is present in more settings too, two to three settings, home, school, and the community with peers. There's no evidence of mania or hypermania, and it cannot coexist with oppositional defiance, intermittent explosive disorder, or bipolar disorder, though interestingly enough, can coexist with major depression, so it can be a secondary diagnosis to that, ADHD, and conduct disorder as well, because conduct disorder, while it, of course, can be associated with aggression, doesn't tend to have this kind of very uh, recurrent aggression that occurs, um, that feels dysregulated. Okay, pyromania next, another impulse control type problem. This one, as well as kleptomania, have similarities to process addictions. Both of them are, uh, involve tension and arousal beforehand, which you tend to see with process addictions, such as gambling, and then pleasure, gratification, and relief when uh, setting fires or witnessing their aftermath. And with kleptomania, it would be you know, when uh, stealing something. This behavior for pyromania is not done for monetary gain, vengeance, to conceal criminal activity, or as a result of a psychotic episode or impaired cognition. Okay? In other words, there's no obvious secondary gain. Kleptomania, very similar to pyromania except it's stealing objects. The same kind of process addiction stuff happens in terms of tension beforehand and then release of it after, afterward. Um, and also not... Uh, the person does not do this out of vengeance or during a psychotic episode. 
Now, of course, fire setting, as you might find in something like pyromania and also in conduct disorder, can be very significant and very serious as a symptom. You're probably familiar with the Eagle Creek wildfire in the Columbia River Gorge uh, that occurred several years ago. The teenager who did this, by the way, who threw the firework that caused the fire, was ordered to pay over $36 million to survivors and victims who suffered damages. And we don't know, of course, whether that teenager had conduct disorder or pyromania or anything like that. They could have just you know, been into fireworks that day. But it is worth noting here that if a person does seem to have a propensity towards fire setting, it certainly is an area of intervention because it can lead to quite serious consequences. So what do we do for treatment planning with conduct and disruptive behavior problems? For prevention, remember that change ideally needs to occur within the environment because of how strong the social factors are. Family and in-home therapy to address power struggles and high conflict at home can be very powerful in oppositional defiant disorder. And advocacy to address structural issues such as poverty, resources in communities, after school activities to prevent gang activity, things like that can be very impactful for conduct disorder. In terms of interventions, initially, with especially with oppositional defiance and with conduct disorder, as well as I would argue intermittent explosive disorder to an extent, we would uh, take the reality therapy approach of helping the person work the system better than they work it. In other words, to help them not get in the jams they get in because of, for example, their verbal or physical aggression. Okay, The reason that we take that approach initially is that a child or adolescent who has a disruptive behavior or, or, or conduct issue is going to see you as irrelevant unless you can prove your worth to, to them. In other words, you can help them avoid jams. You can help them you know, not get into these kind of situations where they need your help, right? <laughs> or they experience the legal or uh, consequences or, you know, other kinds of disciplinary consequences of their behavior, okay? Once you have helped them with that, the child or adolescent will perceive you as having value to them, and then work can begin on cognitive restructuring and empathy development. Cognitive restructuring for things like not perceiving the world as a, a harmful place where you have to look after, out for number one and violate the rights of others. Um, and also empathy development, right? That, that other people might be harmed by your actions and that it would be worth kind of thinking through, is this actually something I want to do um, because of my concern for other people? So that kind of work can't begin initially, but it can be, begin subsequently after you've uh, proved your worth to the client. Now that we've talked about conduct-based issues, we're going to now look at cluster B personality disorders that happen in adulthood. This is often defined as the instability spectrum, somewhat based on attachment and interpersonal traumas that occur in earlier childhood. For example, you may be familiar with the PTSD to borderline personality theory, which is that uh, basically borderline personality is a more exaggerated version of PTSD. Some behaviors in these uh, disorders include violations of socially acceptable mores and etiquette. You also see interpersonal skill deficits. A person may have difficulty with, for example, understanding how to, uh, you know, how to have a healthy relationship. Um, and that, for example, you, you saw with conduct disorder, that, that if, if a person is conning others around them, that other people are eventually going to get frustrated with the person and not want to be around them, right? So there are some skill deficits in terms of sustaining relationships. Behaviors and emotions can change dramatically and quickly. And we've talked before about how bipolar disorder is differentiated from, differentiated for some, from something like borderline personality because with borderline personality, you tend to see more quick mood shifts. And uh, they're often described uh, in communities, clinics, as some of the most difficult or challenging clients. I think in some regards that's a bit unfair because some of these clients really want help and they just you know, have struggled for many years with the kind of behavioral response. I will say what you definitely need working with these clients is patience because it can take years sometimes to see really noticeable change and you just have to keep chipping away at it. So just kind of know that as well, that it's not the change isn't possible, it just requires you to 
to stay with a client longitudinally and be patient. You also do tend to see fragile self, particularly with borderline personality and also with narcissism. Even though a person may present as confident, right, and egotistical to an extent, they may actually be fairly um, uh, insecure. And, and uh, if they're rejected by others, whether in a romantic relationship or they don't get a promotion at work, etc., it can make them quite depressed. Let's talk about antisocial personality first. So this is the extension of conduct disorder in childhood. Note that the person must be 18 and have evidence of conduct disorder before the age of 15. Okay. It is uh, marked by a disregard or violation of of the rights of others, quite similar to conduct disorder. Some of the behaviors are a little different in adulthood. Unlawful behaviors that are grounds for arrest, right? So that some of the legal consequences are more significant. You also do see deceitfulness, lying, conning others for profit or pleasure. Impulsivity and lack of planning, right? This actually feels a little different than in childhood. A person with antisocial personality may be actually quite impulsive, may not have uh, a very organized kind of life, if you will, and they kind of bounce around from job to job, and you know, they just don't seem to have things together. They get into aggression and physical fights often. They have a reckless disregard for the safety of others and themselves. They can be irresponsible at work and with their money, with finances. And they have a lack of remorse and indifference or rationalizing after hurting, mistreating, or stealing it from others. I'll note here an important oh, kind of answer, an important question that I often get asked by students, which is, okay, is this the same as a sociopath or a psychopath? And it's not exactly the same as that, no. In that while the person may enjoy inflicting pain on others, uh, and that does not always occur, but that, that may occur, and the person may have difficulty with empathy, you don't typically see a person with antisocial personality murdering others, for example, out of pleasure. That's not really the way that they operate the world. You'd look for someone who had more of a sadistic type of temperament for that um, versus antisocial personality. Again, this is a survival stance. It's a way in which a person is trying to navigate the world uh, based on earlier childhood, and uh, it gets them into a lot of jams. And it also leads to people not wanting to be in relationships with them, whether friendships or romantic relationships. Okay, borderline personality disorder next. This is marked by instability, right? Unstable relationships. In other words, they may um, have difficulty, again, with sustaining uh, things like romantic relationships or friendships. And part of the reason for that is some of the way in which they approach those relationships. And we'll talk about that in a minute. They also have unstable emotions. They can, for example, vacillate through emotions uh, even within the same day from things like depression to even something like euphoria. And they also have an unstable sense of self, meaning that they often actually feel quite empty inside and they may behave quite differently depending on the people they're around and they may wonder, you know, who am I at core? You also see the following types of behaviors. And before I get to them, I'm going to mention one specific behavior that perhaps is most associated with borderline personality, which is the uh, self-harm uh, stuff, recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures, threats, or self-mutilation. And this can increase a person's acuity and service level. They may need things like inpatient care. They may also often have inpatient hospitalization. And maybe one of the goals is trying to keep them out of the hospital. That can also occur. The other symptoms, and some of them are more co actually quite core symptoms, include frantic avoidance of real or abandoned, uh, imagined abandonment. The abandonment fears are a major factor often in borderline personality and are part of what uh, occurs that pushes people away, makes the relationship unstable. For example, a person may threaten suicide to keep a person there and prevent them from leaving, which puts a per the other person in quite a bind and, and you know is going to impair the relationship. The person may have intense relationships vacillating between idealization and devaluation, what's called splitting, angel or devil, you know, you're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me one day and then the next day you know you're an awful person you know I, I wish I'd never met you self-damaging impulsivity spending sprees indiscriminate sex 
uh, substance use that can be quite significant and then binge eating problems and we've talked about emotional instability already but note that moods can shift every few hours or days the chronic sense of em emptiness and lack of self I described earlier there can be quite intense anger and emotional dysregulation associated with the anger okay as well as transient stress related paranoia or dissociation it doesn't occur very often and it's transient meaning it doesn't last for long but there can be some degree of paranoia and dissociative symptoms associated okay histrionic personality often confused with borderline personality and we'll talk about why after going through the symptoms it's marked by excessive attention seeking and dramatic emotional displays what you'd be looking for here is a person who pushes themselves into the limelight in all social situations and other people find it kind of draining and annoying, right? That this person it always has to be the center of attention. There is discomfort when they're not the center of attention. They use their physical appearance to draw attention to themselves. They may be sexually seductive or provocative. They may have rapidly shifting and shallow expression of emotions. It's hard to get to know them deeply at depth. Right? They may just be a person who keeps people around in a superficial way. And interestingly enough, still considers those relationships as fairly intimate, even when they're not in reality. They may have impressionistic speech lacking detail. You know, there isn't, again, any depth to what they're saying. For example, they may talk about things like he said, she said, you know, the things that people are saying and doing around them without talking about how they feel about that or what's going on inside of them. They are focused a lot on theatrics and exaggerated expression and also can be suggestible, meaning that they tend to go with the kind of wants, the whims of others are easily influenced. Now, I mentioned that this often gets confused with borderline personality. The reason for that is sometimes things like suicide attempts um, in borderline personality to keep the person around, as well as... Um, uh, you know, some of the uh, 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 you know, uh, manipulative uh, type of tactics, are like, such as, you know, suicidal ideation use and, uh, uh, you know, the idealization stuff, you're the best thing ever or the worst thing ever. It can be uh, perceived as being a form of attention uh, uh, seeking, but I don't think it's that, you know, that's not really the goal or aim of it. The goal or aim of it is to keep people around with borderline personality, whereas the aim of it with histrionic personality is to be the center of attention. A person with borderline personality may not necessarily want to be the center of attention, right? Um, they may just want to make sure that the people around them don't leave them. So it's different in that way. A person with histrionic personality, to be honest, wouldn't really care if a friend in their social circle left them, right, or, or got annoyed with them, so long as there are plenty of other people who are interested in them. And then we have narcissistic personality disorder. Again, there are some similarities to some of the other cluster B disorders here. Grandiosity, the need for admiration, and the lack of empathy. We see some degree of grandiosity um, in histrionic personality, right? That I need to be the center of attention. However, with narcissism, this looks like this inflated ego, right? That I am above other people, and I, they need to therefore admire me. The lack of empathy you also see in antisocial personality, but unlike antisocial personality, a person with narcissism does not intentionally try to inflict harm on others, um, you know, ju just to enjoy inflicting harm on others, right? If they do exploit others, it's for a very specific purpose that makes them look good, right? It makes people around them uh, respect them. And so, you know, sometimes I get asked, well, okay, what about CEOs, you know, a dysfunctional CEO, a person who's, you know, just a very negative influence on a company. Are they, do they have antisocial personality? Do they have narcissistic personality? The answer is most likely narcissistic. And the reason that I say that is narcissism tends to be um, more put together in a way that person is more planned for about their behavior and they want other people to think well of them. Whereas antisocial personality, the person probably wouldn't end up as a CEO because they're not that organized in how they approach life. They just kind of buzz between jobs. Um, and also the person, you know, is quite impulsive and they don't really think that much about how other people perceive them. That, that's not saying that organizes their behavior in the same way. 
So the symptoms include this feeling of self-importance, arrogance, feeling haughty, requiring admiration from others, feeling special and unique and only associating with high status people or institutions. Um, for example, they want to work at companies that are Fortune 100, you know, those types of things. They want to go to Harvard, those types of things. There's a sense of entitlement that they expect favorable treatment when they're in restaurants, when they're at work, right? when they're with their partner. They're preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, and ideal love. Right. In other words, that uh, that things can always be better for me. Right. And there, there's some kind of thing that I'm striving towards that just feels to most people around them like very, very excessive. And then there's an exploitation of others only uh, to achieve one's own ends. Only when, again, it doesn't change the way people perceive them. They still want to be perceived as above other people. They lack empathy to the feelings of others, and so they may be likely, for example, to tread on other people to move up the ladder. And they may be envious of others or believe others envy them. Okay, And again, as I mentioned earlier, it's this is fairly fragile. Even though they present themselves as very self-confident, it doesn't take much for that really to be undercut and for the person with narcissism to feel a sense of uh, sadness and even depression if, say, a romantic relationship breaks up, if a friend leaves them, if they don't get a promotion at work, those types of things. Okay, so what about treatment planning? There is actually a lot of literature on treatment options. There have been whole schools of therapy devoted to the cluster B personality disorders. For example, a cohort's um, form of neo-Freudianism that was developed solely for narcissism. So what do we do for prevention? During early adolescence, we want to help a person develop a core sense of self. Family therapy might be very important with this because, for example, with borderline personality, we often think about the invalidating environment. That's a Marsha Linehan term, who, of course, developed DBT for borderline personality. That if a person is invalidated by the caregivers in their environment, they're more likely to have difficulty with that core sense of self right, and, and feeling uh, a sense of who they are and also a sense of comfort in relationships. They may just be highly, highly anxious in attachment relationships. And then social group engagement. For example, a person who is developing narcissistic features or antisocial features, maybe if they're in a, a social group that's going to give them feedback on that, right, uh, you know, that, that uh, for example, you know, when, when you think about yourself as this hot shot, no one else thinks of you that way, so cut it out. Or, you know, when when you um, conned me the other day, you know, that really bothered me, cut it out. Or when you need to be the center of attention at all times, it really annoys the group, cut it out. That type of feedback can be very helpful during adolescence. And adolescents are pretty brutal with feedback, right? And so that kind of social group involvement can be quite powerful. Working through unresolved trauma as it has occurred, especially with things like borderline personality. With narcissism, Often there are childhood beginnings to it that the, the person may, for example, be the golden child, right? And be seen by their parents as above others, or they may, the opposite, feel that they were above their parents because they were caretakers to their own parents. And if that's occurred, there's stuff there, right? A person may feel like they've missed a childhood to talk about. Empathy training, emotion regulation, and cognitive restructuring, all of that matters during childhood and adolescence, as well as in adulthood, of course. But it's going to, again, be preventative if you can do this early enough. If it persists into adulthood and the person does develop a personality disorder, you're looking at chronic ongoing issues that are challenging to interrupt. Here are the things to consider. With antisocial personality, cognitive behavior therapy for cognitions, they would have done the same to me as helpful. Again, after, as I mentioned with conduct disorder, the person feels like you have value to them. So, for example, helping them to work the system better than they work it, right? How to avoid getting into jams. That type of approach has to come first before they'll actually be willing to consider, okay, the way that I think about the world around me maybe isn't the best. Borderline personality, you're looking at affect regulation. DBT is great for this, right? If the person can be able to kind of uh, regulate better. They're not going to make as many 
impulsive decisions to do things like self-injury or, or anger aggression. And mindfulness is a core part of DBT for that reason. Schema focus therapy is often also used for core sense of self. Histrionic personality. This is long-term stuff and it's difficult to get to, but ideally you want to help them go deeper in therapy and really explore who they are at depth. And psychodynamic therapy can help you get there underneath the superficial exterior. But again, the person won't want to go there right away. You have to uh, develop a rapport first and try to avoid discussions that just go about you know the topic of the day. He said, she said, you know, that they said that the people around me are doing all of these dramatic things. Let's talk about that rather than, okay, how do you feel about that? What's going on within you? Narcissism, uh, again, the cohort strategy, self-psychology, that, that intervention, uh, that, that theory can be quite useful. Object relations also focuses on this because we talk, as I mentioned before, the relationship with caregivers does matter. And then coping with breakups um, and with disappointments, you know, as a person able to recognize that they're not the greatest thing ever, right? And that they don't need to perceive themselves that way. Again, that's longer term work. What I often see happen with narcissism, if I'm honest, is that they'll come in with short term depression from a rejection of some sort. They'll make progress on the depression and then they won't return, right? They'll leave therapy at that point. So you want to try to talk earlier about hey, there are some things about the way you navigate the world that I can help you with and set the stage for that if the person's going to continue in therapy and make those changes. In conclusion, early intervention for oppositional defiance and conduct is important but is tricky because their environment's unlikely to change or at least you know, requires a significant amount of prolonged effort to change, such as family work that can last for months to years, changing the way in which the community is kind of structured, is, is funded, etc. can take months and years. Oppositional defiance tends to be associated with verbally aggressive behavior, whereas conduct disorders associated with more devious and planned behavior where empathy may be lacking. Intermittent explosive disorder and kleptomania and pyromania are typically related to impulse control problems and so are differentiated from ODD and conduct disorder. Personality disorders have roots in childhood often and are best characterized as inflexible and problematic patterns of behavior, as you already know. The cluster B personality disorders are commonly seen in outpatient and inpatient settings, and it's pr pretty likely, again, you're going to be working with clients who have these types of presentations in your career. Personality disorders in the professional community have largely been deemed untreatable, especially, I would say, in the you know 20, 30 years ago, they were perceived that way. So now we know that progress can be made and the person can make progress towards, for example, better emotional regulation. Again, it's tricky to work through the core issues of personality. I've explained some ways in which you do that, but certainly you can at least help them manage the symptoms better that, that occur. And that wraps up this video lecture.